50 million years ago, the largest predators in the ocean hadn't yet evolved. The Eocene seas were warm, shallow, and productive, but they belonged to sharks and giant crocodiles. Meanwhile, along the muddy banks of rivers in what is now Pakistan, a wolf-sized mammal with a long snout was fishing in the shallows. It had four legs, thick bones, and ears already adapted to hear underwater. Its descendants would abandon land entirely and become the blue whale, the humpback, the orca, every whale alive today. This is the story of how that happened, how a hoofed mammal became the ocean's apex predator through a series of irreversible adaptations, each one solving a problem while closing the door on land forever. The Eocene Epoch ran from about 56 to 34 million years ago. Earth was roughly 10 degrees Celsius warmer than today. There were no polar ice sheets. Tropical climates extended toward the poles. High carbon dioxide levels meant lush vegetation everywhere, and sea levels levels were far higher than now, flooding continental interiors and creating broad, shallow seas. One of these seas was the Tethys, a vast warm ocean that covered much of what is now South Asia and the Middle East. Its coastlines were lined with river deltas and coastal plains, productive habitats where freshwater met saltwater. Fish were abundant. Crocodiles hunt in the rivers. Early horses, rhinoceroses, and primates lived in the forests nearby. Small hoofed mammals began exploiting the fish in these shallows. They waded into the water, their bodies still built for land, but the food was rich enough to reward the effort. This habitat gradient, from riverbank to mudflat to coastal shallows to open ocean, would pull one lineage of mammals deeper and deeper into the water over the next 15 million years. The fossil record from this time comes primarily from the Kuldana Formation in Pakistan, a series of river delta sediments that preserve the bones of these early experiments in aquatic life. The warm, tropical world of the Eocene created the conditions. The abundant food created the pressure. Evolution provided the solutions. Mammals float. Their lungs are filled with air, their bodies less dense than water. For a land animal trying to hunt fish, this is a problem. You can't ambush prey if you're bobbing on the surface. The earliest whale relatives solved this with bone. Around 48 million years ago, a tiny deer-like mammal called Indohius lived along rivers in what is now India. It was about the size of a raccoon. Its limb bones were extraordinarily thick and heavy, a condition called osteosclerosis. Many of its bones also had an additional outer layer of dense tissue, called pachyostosis. Together, these adaptations made Indohius much heavier than a typical land mammal of its size. This wasn't unique to Indohius. Modern hippos have similarly dense bones, and they use them the same way, to sink. A hippo can walk along a riverbed, its weight keeping it submerged while it feeds or escapes predators. Indohius likely did the same. Oxygen isotope ratios in its teeth confirm it drank freshwater, and the structure of its bones suggests it spent much of its life in rivers. Indohius also had a thickened middle ear bone called the involucrum. This structure is found in all whales, and only in whales. It helps transmit sound underwater. The presence of this bone in Indohius, a mammal that still lived primarily on land, links it directly to whale ancestry. Heavy bones are excellent for staying submerged in shallow water. They let you walk on the bottom, push off surfaces, and stay hidden while hunting. But they come with trade-offs. Dense bones are expensive to grow and maintain. They make running on land much harder, and they don't help you swim long distances. If anything, they make it more difficult. The sinking strategy was a solution to the buoyancy problem, but it was a short-term one. It worked for animals hunting in rivers and shallow coastal waters, but it would not work for the open ocean. The next adaptations would have to address propulsion. Around 50 million years ago, Pachytetus lived along freshwater rivers in what is now Pakistan. It was wolf-sized, with a long-toothed snout and legs built for walking. Its teeth suggested ate fish and small vertebrates. In most respects, it looked like a land predator. But Pachycetus had the involucrum, the thickened ear bone of whales, and its ankle bones had the double pulley structure characteristic of artiodactyls the even-toed ungulates that include deer, pigs, and hippos. This ankle structure, called a double pulley astragalus, is unique to artiodactyls. Its presence in Pachycetus confirmed that whales' descendants
descended from hoofed mammals, not from the carnivorous mesonychids that some paleontologists had proposed. Cacetus likely hunted from the water's edge, using its high-set eyes to watch for prey while partially submerged. Its dense bones helped it sink, but it probably still spent significant time on land. It was at the very beginning of the transition. A contemporary of Pachycetus was Ichthyolestus, the fish thief. About the size of a fox, it had even denser bones than Pachycetus. Its limbs were so heavy that running on land would have been difficult. Ichthyolestus likely spent most of its time in the water, pushing off the bottom with its powerful legs, much like a hippo does today. Then, around 49 million years ago, came Ambulocetus. Its name means walking whale, and it shows exactly what that phrase means. Ambulocetus was about 3 meters long, with a body shaped like a crocodile's. Its spine was long and muscular, and its tail was thick and powerful. Its forelimbs were robust, and its hind feet were large, possibly webbed. Ambulocetus could swim by undulating its body and kicking with its hind legs, much like an otter or a crocodile. It could also haul itself onto mudflats and riverbanks, though its gait on land was sprawling and awkward. The joints of its limbs suggest it walked with its elbows and knees splayed outward, not tucked beneath its body like a modern land mammal. Ambulocetus was amphibious, but it was better at swimming than walking. Its body had begun committing to water. The limbs were still functional on land, but they were no longer optimized for it. Each generation that spent more time in the water would inherit a body slightly less suited to returning to shore. This is the central tension of the whale transition. Every adaptation that improved swimming made water walking harder. Every change that helped hunt in water made living on land more difficult. Once the process began, there was no easy way to reverse it. By 47 to 46 million years ago, a group called the Protocetids had spread across the warm Eocene coasts. These were more aquatic than Ambulocetus, but they hadn't yet fully committed to the ocean. Myocetus, found in Pakistan, had strong swimming muscles and webbed feet. Its skeleton shows adaptations for power kicks and flexible spinal movement. But a fossil of a female Myocetus was found with a fetus inside her, positioned headfirst, the typical orientation for land mammals. This suggests Myocetus still came ashore to give birth. A headfirst birth underwater would drown the calf. Modern whales give birth tail first, so the calf can surface immediately to breathe. Cuchitatus, another protocetid, was wolf-sized with a long snout and limbs still capable of walking. It likely hunted in shallow coastal waters and rested on beaches or riverbanks. In Africa, fossils from Egypt tell a similar story. Phyomycetus, dating to about 42 to 43 million years ago, retained large hind limbs that could support its weight on land. Its teeth were unusual, forward-pointing canines and robust molars designed for crushing. Tooth wear and breakage patterns suggest it ate hard-shelled prey like turtles, as well as fish and possibly other small whales. Phyomycetus was still amphibious, but it was spending more time in the water with each generation. Then came the Bacillosaurids. Around 40 to 35 million years ago, whales like Bacillosaurus and Dorudon appeared in the fossil record. These animals were fully aquatic. They never came ashore. Bacillosaurus was enormous, 15 to 18 meters long, with a serpentine body and a long, flexible spine. Its forelimbs had been transformed into robust flippers for steering. Its tail vertebrae were greatly elongated, supporting a large horizontal fluke that provided propulsion. It swam by moving its tail up and down, using the flexible mammalian spine in a way fish never could. But the most striking feature of Bacillosaurus was its hind limbs. They were still there, tiny legs, each under 60 centimeters long, dangling from a body nearly 20 times that length. These legs had femurs, tibias, and even feet, but they were not connected to the spine. They could not support their weight. They could not help with swimming. They were vestigial, remnants of an ancestry that no longer mattered. Bacillosaurus was an apex predator. Its teeth and jaw structure suggested hunted sharks 
large fish, and even smaller whales. Its size and power made it the dominant predator in the late Eocene oceans, but it could never return to land. Its body was too large, its legs too small. If stranded on a beach, it would have died under its own weight. Dorudin, a smaller relative at about 4 to 5 meters long, shows the same pattern. Strong flippers, reduced pelvis, tiny hind limbs. It lived entirely in the ocean, feeding on fish and squid. Its fossils come from deep marine shale deposits, environments far from any shoreline. The commitment was complete. Whales had traded legs for flukes, nostrils for blowholes, and the ability to walk for the ability to dominate the ocean. There was no going back. Once whales became capable swimmers, they spread across the planet. Even before they lost their legs entirely, they were traveling vast distances. Fossils from Egypt's Wadi al Hitan, the Valley of the Whales, preserve dozens of Eocene whale skeletons, including Basilosaurus and Dorudin. The site is now a UNESCO World Heritage Location. The shale deposits there represent a shallow Eocene sea, and the concentration of whale fossils suggests it was a breeding or feeding ground. In North America, the Ashley Formation in South Carolina has yielded Basilosaurid remains, showing that these whales had crossed the Atlantic by the late Eocene. Georgia Cetus, a protocetid found in what is now Georgia, is remarkably similar to protocetids from India and Pakistan. This implies that even semi-aquatic whales, those that still had functional legs, were capable of oceanic travel. The most striking example is Paragacetus, discovered in Peru and dated to about 42 million years ago. This whale still had large hind limbs and could likely walk on land, yet it had crossed the Pacific or traveled along coastlines from Africa or Asia to reach South America. The warm Eocene currents and the presence of island chains likely facilitated these migrations, but the fact remains, whales colonized the globe while they still had legs. The Tethys Sea and other warm Eocene seaways formed corridors linking the continents. Fossils from Asia, Africa, Europe, North America, and South America show that early whales occupied nearly every warm coastline on Earth. This wasn't a local adaptation confined to one region. This was a planetary transformation. By the time whales became fully aquatic, they had already established a global range. The Basilosaurids dominated tropical and subtropical oceans worldwide. Their fossils appear on nearly every continent, mapping a radiation that spanned the entire Eocene world. How do we know this sequence is real? How do we distinguish evolutionary change from coincidence or misinterpretation? The fossil record provides the foundation. The oldest Eocene rocks contain the most primitive whales, Pachycetus, Ichthyolestus, and their kin. Slightly younger rocks contain more aquatic forms like Ambulocetus. Middle Eocene deposits yield protocetids. Late Eocene strata preserve Basilosaurids. The progression is clear and consistent. Older fossils are more terrestrial. Younger fossils are more aquatic. This stratigraphic order matches what evolutionary theory predicts. Anatomical details reinforce the story. The ankle bone of Pachycetus and Indochius, the double pulley Astragalus, appears only in artiodactyls. This single bone ties whales to hoofed mammals and rules out other groups. The involucrum, the thickened middle ear bone, appears in Indochius and all subsequent whale fossils. It's a unique structure that evolved once in the lineage leading to whales, and it persists in every whale alive today. Chemical analysis adds another layer. Oxygen isotopes in tooth enamel reveal whether an animal drank freshwater or saltwater. Indochius and Pachycetus show freshwater signatures, consistent with their fossils being found in river deposits. Later protocetids show marine isotope ratios, matching their coastal and oceanic environments. Carbon isotopes track diet shifts from terrestrial terrestrial prey to ocean fish. These chemical signatures are independent of the bones themselves, and they confirm the habitats inferred from anatomy. Genetics provides the most recent confirmation. DNA sequencing of living mammals consistently places whales within the artiodactyls. Their closest living relative is the hippopotamus. This molecular evidence arrived decades after the fossils were discovered, but it perfectly matches what the bones predicted. When two independent lines of evidence, fossils 
and DNA point to the same conclusion, confidence increases dramatically. There are still debates. The exact function of Bacillosaurus's tiny legs remains uncertain. Some researchers suggest they were vestigial, serving no purpose. Others propose they were used during mating, providing grip or stability. The precise sequence of sensory adaptations, hearing, vision, balance, is still being refined as new fossils are CT scanned and analyzed. But these debates are about details. They refine the timeline and the mechanisms. They don't challenge the core sequence. Whales descended from four-legged artiodactyls, adapted to water over 15 million years, and became fully aquatic by the late Eocene. The evidence for this transition, fossils, anatomy, chemistry, and genetics, is overwhelming. Around 34 million years ago, the Eocene ended and the Oligocene began. Earth's climate cooled. Polar ice sheets formed for the first time in tens of millions of years. Sea levels dropped. The warm, shallow seas that had dominated the Eocene began to disappear. The Archaeocetes, Pachycetus, Ambulocetus, the Protocetids, the Bacillosaurids, died out. They were specialized for the warm Eocene world, and when that world changed, they couldn't adapt. But their descendants survived. By this time, whales had split into two major lineages. One group, the Mystiquites, began developing baleen, sheets of keratin that hung from the upper jaw and filtered plankton from seawater. These baleen whales would eventually include the blue whale, the humpback, and the right whale. They lost their teeth entirely and became filter feeders, exploiting the vast blooms of krill and small fish in cooler, nutrient-rich waters. The other group, the odontocetes, kept their teeth and refined them. They developed echolocation using clicks and sound waves to navigate and hunt in dark or murky water. This lineage would produce dolphins, porpoises, sperm whales, and orcas, species that hunt fish, squid, and even other marine mammals. By about 30 million years ago, the main body plans of modern whales were established. They had lost all external trace of their hind limbs. Their nostrils had fully migrated to the top of the skull, forming a blowhole. Their forelimbs were flippers, their tails were flukes, and their skeletons were entirely adapted for life in the water but they still carry evidence of their past. Modern whales have tiny pelvic bones buried inside their bodies, remnants of the hips that once supported legs. Whale embryos briefly grow limb buds during development before they regress and disappear. Whales breathe air, give live birth, and produce milk. Their circulatory systems, their kidneys, their metabolisms, all are mammalian, built on a terrestrial foundation and adapted for the ocean. Today, there are more than 100 species of whales, dolphins, and porpoises. They inhabit every ocean on Earth, from the Arctic to the Antarctic, from coastal shallows to the deepest abyssal plains. The blue whale is the largest animal ever to exist, larger than any dinosaur. The sperm whale dives deeper than any other mammal, reaching depths of over 2,000 meters. The orca is an apex predator, hunting seals, sharks, and even other whales. All of them trace their ancestry back to those small, four-legged mammals on the muddy banks of Eocene rivers. All of them carry the genetic code for legs. They just don't build them anymore. The transformation from Pachycetus to Bacillosaurus took roughly 10 to 15 million years. On a human time scale, that's incomprehensible. On a geological time scale, it's rapid. Each generation inherited a body slightly different from the one before. Dense bones gave way to powerful tails. Legs shrank as flippers grew. Nostrils migrated backward, inch by inch, across millions of years. None of these changes happened because whales wanted to live in the ocean. There was no goal, no plan, no intention. There was only one selection. Animals that could hunt more effectively in water left more offspring. Those offspring inherited the traits that made their parents successful. Over time, those traits accumulated. Over millions of years, they transformed a terrestrial mammal into an ocean giant. The fossil record documents this transformation with extraordinary clarity. 
Each discovery, each jaw fragment, each limb bone, each skull adds another detail to the picture. The science behind whale evolution is one of the most thoroughly documented examples of major evolutionary change. It's taught in biology classes as a case study in adaptation. It's cited in debates about evolution as evidence that large-scale transformations do occur, and it's a reminder that the history of life is not static. The ocean's apex predators once walked on land. The largest animals on Earth once waded in rivers, their legs still functional, their futures unwritten. 50 million years from now, who knows what new transformations will have unfolded.